Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first ever Rex Magic K podcast. I'm your host, Andre Tudorencia, and we've got some very special guests for you here today. They are two specialists in medieval magic and the co-authors and translators of Picatrix, a medieval treatise on astral magic. Dan and Charles and David Preka. Dan, David, thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Thank you kindly. Thanks for having me, Andre. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourselves and your relation to history and magic. So I have uh, did my PhD at the Warburg Institute, which is has a sort of venerable tradition associated with it in terms of um, the study of magic and history. I am also the president of the Societas Magica, which is the scholarly society for the study of magic and history. Um, and I'm in the middle of my term doing that. We have our business meetings at the Kalamazoo International Congress on Medieval Studies every year. And, um, and my PhD student, Dan, has been working with me on this for a number of years. So, Dan? Uh, my name's Dan Attrell. Some of you may know me if you're listening. Uh, I run my own lecture series online called Encyclopedia Hermetica. And I also have been working with David on a PhD at the University of Waterloo. And at the moment, we're working on a translation, which I'm not sure if we've gone public with that yet. I don't think we have. No. In fact, this might be the first uh, the world premiere. Well, maybe we should hold on to that and okay. not, not mention it and leave that for another time because it's not really on the subject of magic. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, and, and we want to leave, leave the, uh, uh, the audience tantalized. Yes, of course. Uh, the plan failed to get you guys to reveal your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fair to say that you two definitely know what you're talking about when it comes to magic, so I'm really glad to have you on board. For those who may be unfamiliar with magic, what exactly is magic? How would you define it presently, and how do people during the medieval period have seen it and defined it? There's, there, there is an important distinction that you, that you made in your question uh, in terms of defining magic today versus what it was during the Middle Ages. Um, the Dutch scholar Wouter Hanegraaff is at the cutting edge of, of the theory of the study of magic in history, and his proposal is that magic falls under the umbrella of rejected knowledge. Well, that's esotericism. Mm. Esoteric, which, and magic falls under that umbrella of Western yes. esotericism. But I would say esotericism is a broader layer. Oh, it is, certainly. Certainly. It includes alchemy, it includes phrenology, it includes eugenics, and so on. Right. But magic certainly falls under the sort of pursuit that had at one point been a legitimate pursuit of science, and science has defined itself away from magic since then. Um, Dan, anything to add on that? Well, it's a huge question. It really um, is. I bet, yeah. And, and I would say that for every person who talks about magic, they have a definition of magic. Um, most operating magicians today use uh, something like Aleister Crowley's definition, which is enacting change in the world by the force of will. And so at that point, everything becomes a magical act. And so you see people chaos magicians, these sorts of people who to, th to them, everything is magic and that's fine, but that's not really what we're necessarily talking about when we talk about medieval magic. What we're talking about is the manipulation of substances in order to draw upon the energies of spirits. And that is really the kind of magic that we are looking at in the Picatrix. And tangential to that is natural magic, which would be in the Middle Ages something like working with a lodestone. You know, you attract iron, you rub amber with cat fur, and you see the electric sparks fly, things like that. <laughs> that doesn't operate through the power of demons or spirits but they still considered that to be magical. Yeah. So they called that natural magic, but there is also demonic magic, Goetia, astral magic, theurgy. There are many different sub-branches of magic. Magic tends to have been considered to be a uh, hidden action at a distance. And one can achieve that as much with magic. One observes it acting with tides, but the, magi the, the main point of specialty or of special knowledge that the magician has is being able to manipulate the hidden connections that exist between material things in order to in order to bring about hidden action at a distance. Very interesting, yeah. So for those people that did practice magic in the Middle Ages, 
what attracted them to something with such an enormous social stigma at the time? Why would people engage in magical practices of all these sorts? They would use it to achieve things that they couldn't achieve by regular means. I would say that's the most succinct way to put it. Uh, you have to be pretty motivated to engage in something that was a, that had so much social stigma attached to it. And uh, that wasn't necessarily easy to conduct either and could often be quite hazardous as well in terms of mm -hmm. the materials that are manipulated, as well as potentially the spirit forces that one might be invoking in order to, in order to achieve one's ends. But and this is sort of a subcomponent of the definition of magic as well, is that magic tends to have been goal oriented, unlike religion, which uh, in most instances is practiced for its own sake. I see. So that you'd say was the biggest distinction between magic and religion. I would say so. That one is legitimate, you know, calling upon supernatural forces, whether they be saints or angels or whatever. And the other is illegitimate because it's not practiced under the umbrella of uh, the church. I see. I see. So in terms of rituals and incantations, then, for example, going through the Picatrix, there are a lot of complex rituals and practices of astral magic in there. So how did magical rituals back then really function? Did specific things like speech, motions or movements and objects affect rituals and incantations or? Right. So it's all of these things. Yep. Um, it is sort of like writing a poem, but instead of just using words, you are using every medium available to you collecting plants, collecting stones, collecting metals, collecting angelic names or the names of spirits, doing these specific ritual operations at the right astrological hours that are called for in order to get the right composition of astral rays, because different planets extramit light out from their eyes, essentially. These are <laughs> celestial souls, and that light, which is uh, not the light that we see by, but a kind of spiritual light. It's like the light of light. Hmm. And you would create these talismans, which create these kind of gravity wells, if you will, that suck the rays into a specific area. And by doing so, you can manipulate the course of destiny, essentially. And something I meant to add to what you were talking about earlier, David, mm -hmm. is that magic has this aspect of trying to get things done that you couldn't otherwise accomplish by regular means, mm -hmm. but it's also part of a wisdom tradition. It's, it's also part of this lineage of great ancient sages who had perfected themselves through philosophy, through asceticism, through these rigorous austerities and through extreme scientific advancement. And by marrying that purity of philosophy and that advancement of science, they come together and they create this so-called hermetic tradition. And that is one of the ways by which magicians operate is mm -hmm. they, they marry these two things together. The Picatrix presents magic as the culmination of all sciences because you have to have mastered all of the seven liberal arts in order to even attempt magic right. and, and have any sort of uh, claim to be successful at it. Uh, also, to add to the list you were mentioning uh, just now, Dan, uh, among the other things that one needs to align appropriately is the right animal to sacrifice at the right time because the celestial rays that you were talking about are also infused in all living beings. And when a ritual sacrifice is performed, the rays that were entrapped in that living in creature are released all at once in a sort of esoteric explosion that uh, can enhance the power of the ritual that's being conducted. Also, the right prayers to the right celestial beings and the right divine names have to be included as part of this. So it's a, uh, it's a, a vast number of things that have to go right in order for yep. the magic to work. It's part prayer, part performance art, yep. and part recipe In inner work and yeah there's that that element of it too that's part cooking almost yes <laughs> yeah 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 i mean one of the things that picatrix reminded me of is the the joy of cooking the famous cookbook where mm. you have especially the 1960s editions of it have substantial sections of theory where how to go about uh slaughtering and butchering an animal is discussed before discussing how to uh, make a good roast 
So, wow. and the Picatrix is, is, uh, has frequent sections of theory that are interspersed between, uh, collections of recipes in a very similar kind of way. And the fact that uh, the Joy of Cooking's index spans, uh, I don't know how many dozen pages and ours is about 70, uh, is another anal analogy between the two that, uh, that one can draw. Yeah, for sure. So you say that these traditions and practices have carried on throughout these centuries so far? Well, you'll find a number of practicing astrologers in particular turning to the Picatrix uh, because the astrology that's contained in it and the knowledge of astrology that's assumed of its readers is quite advanced and is quite far beyond what the what the horoscopes you'd get in the average newspaper. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and there's a very small number of individuals who have carried on the tradition or perhaps even rediscovered the tradition of uh, practicing Renaissance astrology. In fact, the other English translation of the Picatrix was done by Greer and Warnock, and Christopher Warnock is, in fact, a practicing Renaissance astrologer. Oh, wow. And a lot of uh, a lot of the notes to their book were, were very useful to us in terms of explaining precisely the technicalities of Renaissance astrology, which we weren't necessarily familiar with from the get go, but we sure are now. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, we are more linguists than astrologers. Correct. Yeah. But we're, we had to familiarize ourselves with the systems and. Uh, learn these things kind of from the ground up in order to offer an adequate translation. Mm. Otherwise, Certainly, yeah. you would just miss out on the actual technical aspects of the practice. This isn't just like, you know, this isn't chaos magic. You, this isn't just anything goes. This is a tradition that has been passed down and it's cumulative knowledge that's been built up for centuries. And so um, it's great that there are still people today who do have a working knowledge of these systems and uh, also put them into practice. Um, now, that said, people like Christopher Warnock, who, if I'm not mistaken, is a Zen Buddhist, is strictly not engaged in animal sacrifice. Right. Now, that, that said, there are people who are. And it, talismanic magic is very much alive and well, and so is animal sacrifice in mm. these types of rituals. You just don't hear about them because they're secret. Yep. The injunction to secrecy is of utmost necessity if you're going to make a talisman. There are people, you know, if you make a talisman, you have to store it in a special container. Nobody can see it. Nobody can touch it. And then that level of secrecy extends to all uses of and the injunctions to secrecy are quite frequent in the Picatrix itself, very much so. They're sprinkled throughout the text quite liberally. Yes. Uh, and, and they, they don't mince words either. I mean, don't let this fall into the hands or of, under the eyes of the, of the unworthy or else bad things will happen. Right. So we mentioned that Vaudet Honograph's approach to esotericism is through the rejected categories of knowledge. Yep. That's only one way of approaching it. Uh, another way is that it is the discourse of hiddenness, of, of, of occultation yep. that makes esotericism. Mm -hmm. um, and Picatrix definitely fits into this mode of secrecy, of being a secret initiator who's leading you through these uh, mysteries that you cannot reveal to anybody else. And that is... You know, it starts, well, I wouldn't say it starts with Pythagoras, but it, it is most prominently begun in the West with Pythagoras and Plato and these various mystery religions that, that dotted the ancient world. And that discourse, that mode of speaking becomes the sine qua non of esotericism. Yeah. One has to be mindful as well with regard to the Picatrix in relation to our own struggles with the technicalities of the text that the Picatrix that we translate it is itself a translation of a translation. And one has to go back to the Arabic original in order to try to untangle uh, some of the technicalities that were lost upon uh, the text's medieval translators. So it wasn't necessarily an easy task to try to recapture uh, the meaning of the text. And then one has to ask, we had to ask ourselves the meaning of which text are we going to transmit in our translation? Is it the original Arabic or is it the Latin? When that option presented itself, we tended to cleave towards sticking to the Latin text uh, by default yeah. as a method of, of approaching our translation. Any particular reason why or? 
Well, because it's the Latin text that wa ended up being popular during the Renaissance. There are 17 manuscripts surviving that date from roughly 1450 to 1650, uh, although the text never saw print because no mm. one wanted, to, it seems, in my mind, it seems as though no one wanted to attach their name to <laughs> so hot a text. Um, and again, the essence of esotericism is not divulging it to the public, <laughs> and printing is the essence of divulging to the public. Yeah. Yeah. So, because of all this secrecy, why would you say the study of medieval magic uh, and its evolution throughout history is an important area of study, knowing that all this is so, such a secretive business, and there's so many factors involved. Why, why is this really so important to know if the other people don't want you to know? Well, there's a bad answer and there's a good answer. Let's hear them both. <laughs> and the bad answer is that the reason you study medieval magic is because it's the stepping stone to science. And that's the, that's the answer that will get you grants and will get people to listen to you and take you seriously but that's not actually a legitimate reason to study magic because it's a lot more complicated than this magic to science uh, linear line. Mm. Really, one of the reasons why you should study medieval magic is because it's an exercise in getting outside of yourself and outside of modernity and seeing that modernity is actually a construct of all kinds of ideas. And we take a lot of those things for granted, but if we can project ourselves into the minds of medieval magi, for example, we can see ourselves in, from inside of a different paradigm and we can really understand our own world a lot better. Yeah. To me, it's a form of respect for the intellectual activity of our not very distant ancestors, who are clearly just as equipped between the ears as we are today, and yet made vastly different choices. And it's precisely the intellectual paradigm that makes the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not due to anyone in the Middle Ages being backward or any sort of negative word you might choose to insert there, uh, that they were pursuing this in all sincerity. Uh, and it's not that long ago. We are not particularly different other than the intellectual background that uh, we are steeped in from the tenderest moments of childhood uh, that make all the difference in terms of the perspective on the world. Yeah, and if we do have to take this sort of teleological approach where we're looking at magic as a, as a road to science, maybe one of the reasons we should do that is to understand that science is cumulative. It wasn't just like there was darkness and then someone flipped the light on in you know, the 1500s, the 1600s, and then all of a sudden there was light and and all knowledge was complete, and then that was the Enlightenment. That's an Enlightenment trope. That is a story that they built for themselves to try to get away from what they thought of as the dirty superstitions of the Middle Ages. They were trying to disenchant the world. And so we need to understand that science is cumulative. You know, we have to thank all those people who ate those plants that killed them, <laughs> or we have to thank all the people who, you know, who was the first person to cook a lobster? I don't know. Must've yeah. been really hungry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or eat fermented shark in Iceland for that matter. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so it's just like every single step of the way, science is this huge cumulative process. And we often think of just these, great men, these magi or these guys in lab coats or white powdered wigs as the only scientists, <laughs> but all of these guys are, bit, are are working off of the cumulative knowledge of, of so many different kinds of people. And magic really helps you to see to what extent science is rooted in, in these, you know, everything from cooking to gardening to going out in the woods and looking at mushrooms and things like this. Yeah, it's, it's not just like a trunk of a tree, it's more like a bush. Yeah. And, and seeing it that way removes the teleological lenses that um, modernity tends to want to put on all of us. Well, it definitely seems like um, magic, medieval magic especially, is very deeply rooted to uh, things like science and other aspects that people might not initially realize. So taking all of that into account, do you think that's the reason why people are still fascinated by the subject of magic in this day and age? I would say that that 
is one of the reasons in academics. Yeah. Because of Lynn Thorndike. Yeah. Good point. And Lynn Thorndike was a scholar who worked at, he was at the Warburg? Um, not no, he was at Columbia. Okay. He was at Columbia. He died in 1965 and produced the, the, um, eight volume history of magic and experimental science. And as an intellectual paradigm, he was one of those to present most forcefully the linear linkage between magic and science. So he, in terms of harnessing vast numbers of sources that had not been looked at by anyone else, he did a fantastic job and did a, a multi-generational service to the scholarly community. At the same time, he framed it in such a way that uh, by default assumed science to be the, the, the great victor in uh, this, uh, this imagined conflict between intellectual enlightenment and ignorance, which did a disservice, I think, to um, a more nuanced perspective on how and why magic was practiced in the past. Yes. Though, as we say, science is cumulative. Yes. And we had to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we had to start with the prejudicial thinking of, mm -hmm. of the late... 19th century, yeah. early 20th century, kind of this arrogance that Newtonian science was the be-all and end-all yeah. of science, and everything was leading up to that. His eight volumes span uh, 1923 to 1958 in terms of their years of publication, so it's, hmm. it's a lifelong endeavor for him, and it's not the only thing that he published either. Right. Some other monumental reference works that, uh, that are still in, in extremely useful for the scholar today, uh, the Incipits of Medieval Scientific Writings in Latin, among other things, um, is an extremely useful resource that he published, and he has numerous articles in history of science publications that have been extremely valuable uh, for my work along the way. And so. he was a Ma massive influence on Francis Yates, Dame Francis Yates, who basically invented the so-called Yates paradigm, which lots of scholars right now are dismantling. You know, everybody loves Francis Yates. It's not to denigrate her legacy or anything like that, but people have looked into her narratives in more detail and seen that things are a lot more complex than this straight line from Renaissance magic to early modern science. Yeah. Which brings us, the, the Dame Frances Yates brings us full circle because she uh, was a faculty member at the Warburg Institute. Oh. And she died in 1981. And her successor, uh, Charles Schmidt, um, died in 1988. And his successor, Charles Burnett, was my dissertation supervisor. So there, that's, we're back to the very first question <laughs> uh, in terms of the link. I mean, I'm now at the University of Waterloo and supervising Dan, as we mentioned earlier, but uh, yeah. <laughs> she, she, the the connection between the history of magic and the Warburg has, has been a long one. The Latin Picatrix is published by the Warburg Institute. In fact, David Pingree's edition from 1986 uh, was done there and then. And uh, so it's uh, one of the few places in the world where one can indulge in these sorts of uh, more esoteric historical studies that are somewhat further from the mainstream than any other topic one would care to mention. I, I don't want to name any because in, <laughs> if I name one, I have to name them all and it's not fair to those I miss out and so on. Anyway. That's understandable. <laughs> well, here's one last question. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see the domain of uh, studying magic going forward, progressing into the future? Where do you see it heading? I, I can say uh, from inside knowledge that the journal that the Societas Magica publishes, which is uh, Magic Ritual and Witchcraft, has oriented itself increasingly toward integrating anthropology into the study of magic and history. Mm -hmm. So it applies a somewhat different theoretical approach, which, to be honest, I'm less familiar with, so I can't really talk about it that much, that, that knowledgeably. Uh, but I know that a sort of more cross-disciplinary uh, work is where... Uh, things seem to be going at the moment. I'm seeing a kind of disintegration of the even the idea of magic. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's been a kind of turn in the academic world to look at the past on its own terms. And what we find is that there's all sorts of activities that people did in the Middle Ages which we would call magic, but if we call it just magic, we're just clumping it all together in one giant nebulous goo, when these were actually these really complex systems that had, you know, there were many different types, 
And we can't just conflate everything together. So astral magic is not the same as Goetia, is not the same as natural magic, is not the same as prophecy, is not the same as alchemy, is not the same as theurgy or scrying. Astral or, magic. Yeah. Uh, so all of these things, we could just dismiss them and say magic, or we can look at them very specifically with a microscope and unpack them with their own language instead of bringing down to bear these really broad categories, words like esotericism and magic and things like that. And I think that that is sort of the direction where we are going is we are focusing in on specific places and times. And instead of trying to write these grand narratives, we're trying to look at specific individuals and how they practiced magic or what magic was to them, let's say. And often we try to just jettison the term altogether. Because it has too much cultural baggage associated with it at this point to be particularly useful in terms of describing any given instance of magic, Right, I would say. So the two big guys that I'm studying right now are Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, and they were both called magicians by Francis Yates in her book, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, which is like one of the main books that started this area of study. And Marsilio Ficino was a magician, but that was only one of his many aspects. He was a doctor and a theologian and a polemicist and a priest and was a humanist, and so a tra the translator of Plato. Expert liar player. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. He did all kinds of things, and so to just say that he was a magician is to really box him in. Mm -hmm. And, or maybe even to say there is no box, and then to kind of make him confused, yep. a confused <laughs> mess. And then when it comes to Pico della Mirandola, he hated magic. He, he practiced Kabbalah and a kind of mystical theology rooted in the works of Dionysius the Areopagite. And it's this kind of Neoplatonic mystical ascent journey. You wouldn't call it magic. Um, he would just call it Christianity in yeah. his mind. Spiritual experience, I guess, yeah. 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 And, and he was very much interested in unveiling the hidden layers of scripture by like piercing through to the original Hebrew and then reading the original Hebrew across various different types of interpretations. And so they called that the spiritual intelligence. And the idea is if you are endowed with the spiritual intelligence, you can see revealed scripture holographically. It mm. kind of like opens up and you see all of the correspondences that link in between texts and in between the various books of the Bible and in between the numbers and the qualities. And it becomes this very, I don't know, psychedelic in a way without <laughs> the use of drugs is just a lot of fasting and, and meditation. And that's a very different thing than magic. Although there are a lot of overlapping uh, cosmological ideas, the use of angels, the use of prayers and divine names. And so there's, there's really a lot of overlap, but it doesn't help to call it magic. We have to, we have to go look and see what did Pico think he was doing. One of the important things to mention about how magic, uh, or how we can observe magic to have been practiced historically is that it tended to operate, um, mostly through analogical thought. That it's the analogies, the similarities between things that, uh, were thought to underpin the hidden or esoteric connections between them. And that's why Mars, as a red-looking dot in the sky, ends up being associated with bloodshed, because blood is also red. Right. Hmm. For example. And, and it all culminates in the idea that God is the ultimate good, and the ultimate good would want everything else to be good. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it wants everything else to be like it. And so there's this journey of mystical ascent through climbing the analogies and through the correlations of different things in this world. You are ultimately climbing up this ladder, which ends in union with the divine. And that was uh, true both in Christianity, in Islam, and in Judaism, yep. in all of their magical systems. And it's present in the Big Drinks. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Well... Dan, David, thank you guys so much for enlightening us here with all this incredible information. Hopefully, 
the domain of magic does continue expanding and progressing into further areas of research. And thank you all for coming on here today. Thank you very much, Andre. Having it's been a pleasure. Uh, likewise, thank you.